Hi, uh, welcome everyone to the Zoom of Scientist series. This series is sponsored by Lake Champlain Sea Grant, UVM Extension, and SUNY Plattsburgh's education program known as the Watershed Alliance. Uh, Lake Champlain Sea Grant develops and shares science-based knowledge to benefit the environment and economies of the Lake Champlain Basin. Watershed Alliance aims to reach K through 12 students and their teachers throughout the Lake Champlain Basin. Our goal is to increase awareness and knowledge of watershed issues in, the, in youth throughout Vermont and New York. The Zoom of Scientists series was created in response to the current need for more virtual programs. So I'm gonna introduce and welcome today's presenter. His name is Bill Ardren. He is a senior fish biologist at the Lake Champlain Fish and Wildlife Conservation Office in Vermont. He received the 2018 Rachel Carson Award for Exemplary Scientific Accomplishment for his work on restoration of landlocked Atlantic salmon in Lake Champlain. Before moving to Vermont, he was the regional geneticist for the Pacific region of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He has a PhD in fishery science from the University of Minnesota and conducted postdoctoral research at Oregon State University. So, Bill will be talking about restoring landlocked Atlantic salmon in Lake Champlain. And to give you a little introduction, by the 1850s, dams, habitat degradation in rivers, and other factors had eliminated or extirpated landlocked Atlantic salmon, or abbreviated as LATS, from the Lake Champlain Basin. Restoration efforts, including hatchery culture, stocking, and sea lamprey control, have been successful in restoring the lake fishery valued at more than $200 million, but this depends on ongoing stocking. Dr. Bill Ard Ardren has developed a series of large-scale adaptive management experiments to restore naturally repro um, reproducing LATS with the goal of fish returning to multiple tributaries, migrating upriver, spawning, and reproducing uh, fry that will lead to self-sustaining populations. So uh, Bill, if you want to get started. Great, thanks for that, Elizabeth. Bill, I'm gonna pull up your presentation right now, so just give me one second, but if you wanna start chatting, that is A-OK. -okay. Sure, I'd be happy to. First of all, thanks, Elizabeth, for that great introduction. I, I really appreciate it. And I, I also really appreciate, Ashley, you asking me to uh, join this series. It seems like a really good idea, especially during the, during the pandemic. I wish I could be there in person with you or even on the computer. Um, I'm moving a little bit fast today because my daughter actually is playing in a Vermont championship volleyball game outside at South Burlington. So I'm talking to you from a parking lot uh, today with the slides in my hand because I need to go out and watch the game here right after. So uh, there will be additional resources at the end too. Uh, for you to be able to check out to answer additional questions. And I'm always happy to follow up and talk about salmon at any time. Great, so thanks, are, 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 are you ready to go? I think so, Elizabeth. You can see this, right? This all looks good to you? Oh, yeah, I can see. Okay, great. Yep, all set, Bill. Great. So um, basically what's happening is a restoration program, as you heard, Elizabeth talk about already is underway in the, the Lake Champlain Basin to bring back landlocked Atlantic salmon. And you can see one of our biologists here, Nick Stats, holding one of those landlocked salmon that's returning to spawn back to the Winooski River uh, during the fall. And the different emblems you see on this slide uh, indicate that this restoration effort really is a partnership between Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and New York Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, and in partnership, we're also working really closely with the Lake Champlain Basin Program and, and other groups uh, to get the message out um, around what's happening. And it looks like I'm gonna have to add Lake Champlain Sea Grant on here now too, um, after this presentation. So next slide, please. So the next slide should be the Atlantic Salmon Life Cycle. And I just wanted to remind folks of the salmon life cycle. In my world, everybody knows this, but I realize that um, not everybody uh, has it memorized um, or is familiar with it. So I thought it would be worth running through. And if we start with the eggs on this example, 
the eggs down on the bottom there are buried in the gravel um, by spawning salmon in the fall. And then they incubate over the winter and hatch in the spring. And these av avalanches um, come out of the uh, gravel and then they turn into fry in the spring and they overwinter uh, at least two winters in, in the streams and as par, these slightly larger fish that you see in this circle. And then eventually, um, after about two years in the stream, they out-migrate to the lake as smolts. And when they out-migrate to the lake as smolts, they remember which river they came from. They remember the odors from that river. And so they grow up in the lake and they, they have more to eat out in the lake and become large in size. And they're important for the fishery out there. And they're an important part of the ecosystem for Lake Champlain. And then when they reach between three and four years of age, they return back to the river that they were stocked in, or hopefully now that they were born in with some of the restoration work that we're doing. And they start that whole cycle over again. So basically Atlantic salmon need a lot of interconnected habitats uh, in order to you know, have this whole life cycle move through. So I just wanted to remind folks of, um, about some of those key aspects of the salmon life cycle before we got started. So if we could go to the next slide, please. It should be a slide of the St. Lawrence River regions. And this is to emphasize that Lake Champlain and Lake Ontario used to contain the largest representation of landlocked Atlantic salmon of anywhere in the world. The tributaries around Lake Ontario and the tributaries around Lake Champlain, uh, you know, had many, many populations of, of landlocked Atlantic salmon. And, and it really was the most striking example um, of landlocked Atlantic salmon populations in the entire world. So can we go to the next slide, please? What do I mean by landlocked salmon? Most of the time we think of salmon as fish that grow up in the ocean, not in a lake. And, and that's basically what happens with most salmon populations. They go out to the ocean to grow to the larger size and then back to the river. Well, it turned out during glacial times, uh, you know, Lake Champlain was connected to the ocean about 13,000 years ago. And that allowed salmon to get here and migrate up through the St. Lawrence River and basically what's the Richelieu River now into Lake Champlain. And once the glaciers receded and the Champlain Sea was disconnected from the, the ocean and Lake Champlain became disconnected from the ocean, there were salmon that were trapped here and they became landlocked. And they were able to continue their life cycle because there was enough forage fish here for them to be able to grow to large sizes. And it turns out it was, it was smelt that were uh, within Lake Champlain that served as that forage base. And it allowed many natural populations um, to, to evolve here in Lake Champlain without going to the ocean. So next slide, please. So historically, Lake Champlain had around eight salmon rivers. And so you can see here that about 50% of the lake is uh, over 50 feet deep, which allows for some stratification uh, to occur, which allows for salmon to be able to find the cool water during the summer and also for these, uh, to find these forage fish that they need. And so uh, Lake Champlain had the ecosystem to support at least eight large populations of salmon. And two of them that we're gonna talk about today in, in great detail are, are those that were in the Boquette River and in the Winooski River here um, on the Vermont side. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, please. And historically, there were many uh, populations of salmon, like I said, and they were very abundant. So what was going on is that when you go back and you read about the rich history of things that have gone on around Lake Champlain through the years, for example, you know, around the Revolutionary War, you can see in journals um, of the soldiers that they're trading salmon. Um, and in this case, it was trading 75 salmon to a petty officer in Benedict Arnold's gunboat fleet in 1776 or other um, journals documenting that horses are afraid to cross the streams in the fall because there are so many spawning salmon and that, you know, they were able to collect over a thousand salmon in a single haul um, off of Chesterfield, New York with, with seines during, during the fall time. So it's, you know, it's really striking. And actually 
if you go back and look at the Clinton County seal on the New York side, you can see that there's actually a salmon there with it. Um, and part of that is, I think, the rich history that early on when that seal was being developed, uh, you know, they they recognized the importance of salmon and, and even wanted to emphasize it um, on the seal. So the next slide, please. So that salmon disappeared from Lake Champlain around the 1840s, um, and, and from Lake Ontario in the in the 19, or in the 1890s. And the major stressors or causes for this were the mill dams that were put into place, you know, to provide power, and then also um, a lot of the industrial, uh, you know, uh, building that uh, that occurred with those mills, as well as a lot of the deforestation that happened with the agricultural practices. And you can see here, you know, um, even as, you know, recently as the 1930s, uh, things looked a lot different in Willsboro, for example, or Burlington, um, you know, in terms of land management, in terms of, of, of river management and, and sort of our understanding of, you know, the interconnectedness of habitats and how that affects uh, fish and how that affects the, the whole ecosystem. So basically what happened was you deforest, you know, a lot of the area and then you get a lot of sediments that get in the river and then the eggs can't survive uh, in the gravel because they're suffocated. Or the salmon can't make it up to the areas that have the gravel because there's a dam in place to power a mill and so forth. So basically by the 1840s in Lake Champlain, there were no salmon left, unfortunately. So can we go to the next slide, please? But it, over the you know past 20 years, there have been a lot of these limiting factors that I just mentioned um, have been addressed and have been reduced. So you know dam removals have happened. There's been uh, increased information about how to reintroduce salmon back into the rivers from the hatcheries and how to do that effectively. There's been work to restore the riparian habitats and you know, the trees along the, the riverbanks and, and throughout the watershed and land management practices uh, for agriculture have really improved um, as well to minimize things like uh, sediment runoff and other things that, that are, are detrimental to, to salmon restoration. Um, in addition, sea lamprey, which we'll talk a little bit more about, um, we've been able to find ways to address sea lamprey predation on salmon, which is a limiting factor, and also some of the changes in forage fish. Can I get the next slide, please? So in 1973, uh, basically the, the three agencies I mentioned in the beginning, Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and New York DEC worked together to come up with a joint plan uh, to reintroduce salmon into the lake. And the major focus was to rear them at hatcheries around the lake and introduce them as two-year-old fish. So bypass that whole river part of it. Just get them old enough to get into the lake and grow to become part of the fishery. And that, next slide, please. So that's restoring that lake fishery first was really successful. And there's, you know, if you know people who fish out in the lake, that for the most part, I think they're really happy with what's been going on over the past, you know, 20, 20 years or so in terms of the, the number and size and condition of these salmon that they're catching. And so that, that's all been really, really successful. Um, it's helped to create a $20 million fishery in the lake. And I think a lot of people are really happy around that uh, work. So can we go to the next slide, please? One of the major things that we're doing to allow those salmon to survive is actually to control the sea lamprey populations. So sea lamprey um, are parasitic to salmon. They also grow up in the rivers, same rivers that salmon are in, as well as other rivers in the deltas of the rivers. When they reach a certain age, they swim out into the lake. They look for a fish host, which is preferentially lake trout or salmon, attach and then basically suck their body fluids. Um, and if there are too many lamprey attached, the salmon will die. And so that's what this slide is trying to show that when we were in the uh, 2000s to about 2009, the number of wounds on a salmon were really high as indicated by the, the line that's drawn there. 
And so there were very few salmon indicated by the bars here um, on the bottom that came back to the rivers. But when we reduced the number of sea lamprey wounds on the salmon, which you can see from about 2010 until present, the number of salmon coming back to the rivers by the bars that you can see there on the far right really started to shoot up. So one of the ways that we started to get more salmon back and, and allowed them to live long enough to come back to the rivers has been with sea lamprey control. Next slide, please. In addition to sea lamprey control to try to get salmon to reestablish natural populations and not only have the lake fishery for them, we started to remove dams in the basin. And so there's been lots of partners that have tried to uh, work with local towns and, and with different agencies and companies uh, to be in, in landowners to remove dams and allow salmon access and other, other aquatic species access to habitats they were historically in. And one of the biggest success stories is really the Willsboro Dam removal in terms of salmon restoration. And that took place in 2015 and opened up over 100 miles of habitat in the Boquette River for salmon to spawn naturally. And so we are seeing big success um, at, in, related, related to that dam, dam removal. So it's been, it, that's been a pleasure to, to work on with, with the folks from Willsboro and, and, and others. Can we go to the next slide, please? In addition to removing dams, we also are where the dams can't be removed. We are trying to work on passing fish above them with the dam operators. So Winooski One Dam, right there at the traffic circle in Winooski, uh, has a fish lift, and so that's a hydropower dam. It's it's producing green energy, uh, but in addition uh, to that, you know, it's blocking the salmon from being able to make it up to the areas where they could spawn naturally. So as a compromise, uh, the dam operators uh, fish this trap in the fall. They take the salmon, place them into a truck, and drive them around the dams so that they can spawn naturally up by uh, Richmond, Vermont. Can we get the next slide, please? So now that we've been able to address some of these limiting factors, we are really into uh, trying to get increased river runs of salmon back. And their goals are number one, to increase the returns of these hatchery origin salmon back to the rivers. Number two, enhance the tributary fishery for salmon in these rivers. And number three, restore natural reproducing salmon so that we'll have wild runs and not need to rely as heavily on the hatchery uh, populations. Next slide, please. So the way we're trying to do that is with targeted research. And, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to optimize the way that we rear the fish in the hatchery so that they perform the best after we release them. And by the best, I mean, remember the lake, uh, or, I'm sorry, remember the river that we stock them into as they migrate out to the lake so they could come back as adults and try to start that whole cycle that we started the whole talk off with um, in the beginning. And what we found is that just by trying to give fish more natural conditions in the hatchery so that they can perform and be ready to imprint to the rivers or behave in a way that you know, is, it allows for higher survival of the fish because they have a more natural environment that they were reared in, it's resulted in three to five times higher uh, return rates to the rivers right, right there in Winooski. So next slide, please. So what have we found? Well, we found that um, some success. In, in 2016, we found for the first time in 150 years naturally produced fry in, in the uh, Winooski River near Richmond. That was just, it was, it was so exciting. It was, it was really, really exciting to see. In addition, we found naturally produced fry in the Boquette River on the New York side in 2017 and 2019 as well. So that's the first time we've documented natural reproduction by salmon in 150 years and really builds on all those conservation success stories, um, not only uh, by you know the folks that I mentioned at the beginning of this slide, but the whole conservation community and the communities you know around Lake Champlain. So I think it's really something, uh, an important milestone uh, towards reestablishing these natural populations that we should all all be proud of. Because salmon, I think, are a good bioindicator 
for how we're doing with our with our land management as well as our management around the rivers. So we are doing additional steps. What's next? Well, we're going to try to improve downstream fish passage. We're, we're going to try to continue to increase habitat, track the salmon movements in more detail, and try to address things like thymine deficiency um, that is caused by eating a non-native alewife. So can I get the next slide, please? I'm gonna just go into a couple of these to wrap it up here today um, as, as examples. So one of the things we're doing right away is right now is assessing the habitat. So we're going out right now, this time of year and finding the salmon reds. Those are the nests that the, the, the females dig and they bury their eggs in and, and how they incubate over the winter like we talked about in the beginning. And so we're trying to assess the habitat quality of those and we're trying to use those to help prioritize restoration areas and rivers with partners that are also working to reduce phosphorus inputs and, and other you know, restoration work that's going on within the basin. And it's been a pleasure to try to work um, across you know, all these different disciplines and goals uh, with, within the basin. So that's, that's, it, it's something that will continue uh, to move forward. Uh, next slide, please. In addition, we're trying to look at the movements of salmon and trying to figure out what habitats they're using in more detail in the river by placing small radio transmitters in them. And that's allowed us to understand how long the salmon stay above the dams in the Winooski after we track and truck them. Because unlike Pacific salmon, Atlantic salmon can uh, live to reproduce a second time. And so, you know, that's an important part. Can these salmon get back downstream over the dam safely? And maybe they fall back by accident. And then how do they get back up if that's the case, um, if they fell back before they were able to spawn naturally? Next slide, please. And the final one that I'll tell you that we're working on is that it's a really interesting and unexpected issue that when the non-native ale, alewife was introduced into Lake Champlain in 2003, um, we, we didn't know that when salmon ate them, they would develop a vitamin B deficiency. So the salmon eat these alewife because they look like great forage fish uh, for them. They do grow to large sizes and they, they are nutritious for them, but they lack this vitamin B1 um, essential vitamin. And that causes for a deficiency that uh, impacts the ability for them to produce viable offspring. So, so that's another issue is we're trying to establish a brood stock at our White River National Fish Hatchery that tries to use a concept called evolutionary rescue, where you let evolution try to occur by just through natural selection of fish that can survive by eating alewife and try to preferentially mate those fish so that we can increase the tolerance for low thymine associated with eating this non-native forage fish within the basin. So if I could go to the last slide, that's the acknowledgement slide. Another one of our biologists with the big salmon there from the Boquette River uh, that, that came back from a stocking effort and helped to reestablish the natural population. And this slide I think is really important because it shows how many people it takes to do this type of work. It's a lot of people, um, a lot of organizations, a lot of effort, um, you know, a lot of communities that are needed to bring back a species like salmon and I think the fact that we are making progress on it should make us all proud that, that we are seeing progress with our restoration efforts. And a lot of the funding comes through um, targeted appropriations through Senator Leahy's office. So I need to acknowledge um, Senator Leahy and their staff for being so supportive. And then as well as you know, many of our university partners and local partners and, and other agencies um, as well. So if we could go to the final slide, I'd just like to thank everybody for their time and listening today and show you um, one of those very first, you know, fry that we found in the Winooski River. Um, and this one was collected in the summer of 2016. So um, at this point, I'd, I'd be happy to take any questions from folks. Great, thank you so much, Bill. I think what is so fascinating about this story that we don't often see in terms of management and conservation and restoration are these success stories. You know how long it takes to 
recreate habitat that has been degraded over, um, you know, long periods of time. And so to see that these projects that, you know, as you're mentioning, have so many partners and um, have taken so much time are actually starting to rear results that are great for not only the fisheries, um, but also kind of the, the entire ecosystem here in the Lake Champlain Basin. So thank you for that. Um, now, if folks have questions, I know we have Bill for just a couple minutes here because he does have to leave, but if you would like to put a question in the chat box or in the Q&A, um, we would be happy to, um, to field that for you. So I'll give folks just a couple seconds. So one question, um, Bill, that, that I have for you. Um, so, you know, I'm heavily involved in kind of community science. I'm curious what opportunities you think there are for um, either citizens or student groups to be involved in um, kind of helping with habitat restoration or any pieces that you might suggest to folks out there that are interested in, you know, being involved in um, projects like this, but maybe don't have a background in fisheries. I think that's a great question. And I think there are many opportunities to do uh, that type of work. For example, you know, we have a salmon in the schools program and that allows a lot of the kids to understand the life cycle of the salmon, rear some of the eggs in the classroom and then outplant the fry into the rivers. So we try to get the kids involved there. So, you know, if we happen to have any teachers or parents on the call that you know, things that their kids might want to get engaged in that, they can reach out to our office and say that they would love to be a host for Salmon in the Schools program. And another thing that folks can do if they're anglers is we're going to start reaching out to try to get anglers to provide samples back to us to better understand what's going on out in the lake because it's hard to get a hold of fish out there. And then finally, I think, you know, a, another piece on this is the riparian restoration there's so much good work going on with tree plantings and, and, and other works um, alongside of the stream that, you know, you can work with a lot of the local watershed groups in your area uh, to be able to volunteer and get out and, and plant some trees, you know, as well. And, and those are just, just a few ideas um, that, that are out there. And I'm sure reaching out to Sea Grant, too, um, you know, would, would be another way to, to try to uh, you know, identify some of those additional opportunities that I that I'm probably missing right now. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for that little list there of questions. Um, Elizabeth, we've got a question coming in the chat yeah. box. Ask that. <laughs> sure. Um, so Charlotte would like to know how you caught the salmon for your projects. Yeah, great question, Charlotte. You know, we we catch our salmon in a variety of ways. One way is um, we snorkel for the really small salmon in the rivers. So we snorkel along with just a little aquarium net. And when the fish are really small, they can't swim that fast. So we quickly net them up and then we sample them and then we re release them again alive. Um, so of those small fish you saw, that's the way we captured them. When they get a little bit bigger in the rivers, we actually use electricity and they call it electrofishing. And the electricity shocks the fish enough that you stun them to be able to net them up. And once again, it allows you to sample them and release them again alive uh, back out into the river. And once they get out into the lake, sometimes um, we also use electricity for that uh, when we can, when the salmon are close enough to the shore. Sometimes we work with anglers to um, get a sample from them when they're, they're catching fish. And then when the adults come back to the river, we use a variety of different traps. Sometimes we use uh, uh, what they call a hoop net, which are these kind of hula hoops that have netting around them that looks, you know, almost almost like, a, um, you know, basically like an accordion almost uh, that you'd spread out. And, and then the fish will swim up and they'll swim into this kind of minnow trap uh, style net and we can get them that way. Or I, I showed you the photo of uh, the, the trap at the dam. Uh, in Winooski. And that you can visit. Uh, this year, it's probably not the best time because most of the fish have already been passed upstream. But next fall, uh, you should head down to the Winooski One Dam uh, and you, you can check out the, the fish trap there and the, the elevator where, where they catch the salmon and, and we process them to move them upstream. 
Yeah, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. I actually, when I was teaching, took a class there and we um, worked with your colleague, Nick, and were able to see some of the fish and hear a little bit more and then learn about the Hydro One Dam. So that was actually a really, a really great, um, that was a really great project for my students. Um, question coming in from my colleague, Mark Malikoff. Mark is asking if there are any updates on Canadian or New York DEC ALS restoration efforts in Lake Ontario. Great question, Mark. Well, first of all, I have to say, Mark, great to see that you're on. Uh, it's a, Mark's been a really great colleague and, and friend that's helped on some of these projects through the years. So, so great, great to hear that, that you were listening today and asking some questions, Mark, and, and thanks for all your help on these, these efforts too through the years. Um, yes, Lake Ontario is seeing some success as well, although it's a little slower over there in part because they also have a really robust Pacific salmon population, um, meaning Chinook salmon and coho salmon and steelhead. And, and they really uh, emphasize you know, that part of the fishery with, within their management priorities there because it's a big economic boom uh, for those communities. So salmon, Atlantic salmon restoration is important to them, but it's one of many species. So it doesn't quite get as many resources as it does in Lake Champlain, where we focused on really restoration of, of native Atlantic salmon. So, you know, they, I would say that they're just a little bit behind us right now, Mark. Uh, but, you know, they're still, still trying hard and, and trying many of the same efforts. And we collaborate back and forth, um, trying to share our successes and challenges uh, with one another. Yeah, that's, that is, that's great. Um, thinking about that slide and looking at those, those dates when each, uh, each kind of Lake Ontario and Lake Champlain began to lose and eventually lose all of their populations of landlocked Atlantic salmon. Interesting to think about the trajectory that we are both on as, you know, very different ecosystems and very different um, kind of research priorities and things like that. Um, one last yeah. question um, before you go, Bill. I just had a question. I'm curious. Um, there are folks out there that maybe want to connect with you personally. Would it be okay if we gave them your email? I have some other research resources that you provided. I'll, I'll present to them after, but um, I think there were sure. other questions that were a little bit more specific to you. Is that okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm always, like I said, I'm always happy to talk about salmon. So go ahead and provide my email to folks. Um, I also provided these links that I encourage mm -hmm. folks to look at. There's been a lot of work to share the salmon story more broadly. Um, and these links provide, you know, a number of videos, short videos that have been done through the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Um, and and it's, it's just really, really nice videography that's done there uh, by Vince Frankie and Peregrine Productions. And then also, you know, there is a great traveling display last year through International Year of the Salmon that went out on the Lewis McClure um, uh, and went to some of the different ports. Um, around Lake Champlain. And so you can click and look at those, those displays that talk about life history and partnerships and, and history of salmon and all those sorts of things. So I encourage folks to look at that. And then finally, there's a link to some, uh, a blog site that kind of followed us around um, in 2017, you know, for, you know, the whole salmon season in the fall and tried to tell all these stories and, you know, in a lot of detail as well. So there's a, there's a lot of really rich information there. So I encourage folks to take a look at that first. And then if they still have some questions for me, um, that'd be great because we're always open for new ideas or happy to share, um, you know, so, some of the things that, that we're up to with folks. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Bill. We will let you zip off to that championship game. And then I will talk through the um, bring back the salmon video series and a couple of those other resources and we'll put the links in for folks. So thanks again. Um, thanks again, Bill, for joining us today. So oh, I'm, I'm so happy. I'm so happy to do it. And if there's a chance to, you know, come back again sometime and talk even more about salmon, I, I'd love to do it or someone else um, from our staff or from our partners, um, I'm sure could tell a slightly different angle on, on the salmon story too. So, so keep, keep us in mind in the future. We'd love to come back. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Um, all right. So as Bill mentioned, bringing back the salmon video series, it's a three part series um, that kind of tells the story of landlocked Atlantic salmon restoration efforts here in the Lake Champlain Basin. So um, 
Elizabeth is going to put the link to the Lake Champlain Basin page where you can find that. Um, and it looks like actually Eric Howe already did. Thanks, Eric. And then a couple other pieces that you may want to check out. Um, Elizabeth can put the links in for these. So the salmon exhibits, exhibits on landlocked salmon um, that were kind of co-developed by the Basin Program and U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, kind of have been a series of traveling exhibits. It looks like Colleen Hickey is saying from the Basin Program that um, we still have this exhibit series on display at the Champlain Center Mall in Plattsburgh, New York. Um, so if you are around there and want to check it out, it sounds like that is still available. Um, and then uh, a fun little note here, Colleen is also saying that she saw folks out angling for salmon today at Hatchery Brook. Um, so people are enjoying that fishery. And then lastly, there is a U.S. Fish and Wildlife blog series on landlocked Atlantic salmon if you want to stay up to date on that. And Elizabeth will put the link in the chat box for that. So I'm just going to launch a real quick poll. As always, thank you so much for joining us. And we want to hear from you and how you enjoyed today's session. Um, so that should be popping up on your screen right now. Just uh, you can go ahead and just click in that pop up box. If you have other feedback that you want to give to us and that is um, a little bit longer, you can pop it in the chat and just send it to all the panelists and we will um, we will take note of that. And then as always, uh, I will let Elizabeth, um, invite you to our next session. Sorry, I had to unmute. <laughs> yep, so uh, if you enjoyed this session um, and are eager to know what's up next for the Zuma Scientist series, uh, the next presentation will be called Managing Lamprey in the Lake Champlain Basin. And you already heard a little bit about lamprey in this presentation, and it will be happening on November 10th at 3.30 p.m. And if you uh, want to sign up, I will put the link after I stop speaking um, <laughs> for the Virtual Learning Center to register Register. And also, of course, you can um, view any of the past um, uh, videos on the Lake Champlain Sea Grant YouTube channel um, in case you missed them or if you want to review them. Uh, and for a little introduction for the next week, um, I don't know if it's next week or the two weeks from now, whenever November 10th is, um, if you're wanting to know a little bit about that, participants will hear from Stefan Smith, a fish biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Office in Essex Junction, about what is being done to control sea lamprey populations in Lake Champlain. So we'd love it if you could come join us for that. Awesome. Thanks, Elizabeth, and thanks everyone for joining us, and we will see you next time.